<laughs> Welcome everyone. Everyone can see me okay. Um, thank you so much for joining us for the Situate Historical Society GAR Hall special events first Zoom presentation. As I said, it's our first, so please um, bear with us. If there's any glitches, we'll try to get through them as quick as possible. Um, due to the pandemic, you know, everything has been closed. We've had to alter the way that we do things. One of our big things is um, our presentations. So we've got a lot of them. I've got about 10 of them scheduled coming up. Um, and I'll be posting them after her night. I'll be posting our next one. Again, it will be um, an event that you will need to register for. There is no fee. Um, donations are welcome and much appreciated through our PayPal link. As most of you know, all of our historical sites are closed right now and they will be closed through February. So we won't be having our open houses. We won't be having any visitors. So um, donations are actually down. And like I said, if you want to, that's fine. If you aren't able to at this time, we totally understand. You don't need to, it's not required. We just wanted to give back to the community what we have been doing for the last two years at the GAR Hall. So tonight we have local guy, Herb Crean. He has been with the Red Sox for over 25 years now. And he is gonna tell us some great stories, give us some information. At the end of his presentation, he will do a question and answer period. And again, I ask that you keep your mics muted. And if you want to put something in the chat, please do, because I'm following it along right now. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Herb. Thank you, Jean. And after all the hard work you had to do to put this together, I feel like you're an old friend and it's really been great to work with you. And it's great to be back in situate. Uh, usually I get to present to the situate council on aging, uh, obviously. This year that did not work out. Um, but a big part of my heart is on the South Shore. I grew up in Hull and uh, spent a good chunk of time in Cohasset. And uh, I still have family. My uh, daughter, Allie, is uh, here with her family. And my sister lives in Cohasset. So the point is, uh, it really is uh, my home away from home. It has a big, big slice of my heart. The topic today, this evening, is going to be greed, avarice, and three base hits. I'm going to spend more time on the three base hits because they're a lot more fun. I, I don't think any of us are, are fans of greed, greed and avarice. <laughs> so I'm going to focus on the three base hits. And... Uh, before I, I actually start, I think it's good to recognize that tomorrow is Jackie Robinson Day. And uh, normally it's April 15th, which was the first day that uh, he actually uh, played in a major league game. Uh, obviously, there weren't any games to celebrate him uh, on April 15th. It was pushed ahead uh, to this particular date. Uh, mainly because it's just about the uh, the halfway point. And uh, I think most of you are pretty familiar with Jackie Robinson. Uh, one of the ironies uh, is that he was not the first African-American player in the major leagues. Wellfleet Walker, <laughs> who played in... 1894, with the uh, Syracuse Blue Stockings, was in fact African American. And uh, at the end of the season, unfortunately, the uh, the owners and uh, some of the senior players got together and decided that they were just going to flat out ban anyone of African American descent. And uh, they call it a gentleman's agreement. How in the world they can consider that to be a, a gentleman's uh, agreement? It, it seems pretty much like the opposite. So all that time went by from 1894 till 1947. Uh, 
Jackie made his debut on April 15, 1947. He had played the previous year in Montreal, uh, and Branch Rickey, who was the uh, president of the Dodgers and who put this all together, knew that Montreal was, a, a, let's say, a more sophisticated uh, city that would be able to absorb it. And, uh, you know, people will ask me, what took baseball so long? How come it was, wasn't until 1947 that baseball integrated? And the, the fact is, the armed services, our military, was not integrated until 1948. So, shame on baseball, shame on us. And worse than that, it was integrated in 1948 and the general said, no, nah, we're not gonna pay any attention to that. So for four years it, it languished, and then we had uh, President, uh, well, first General Eisenhower, and then President Eisenhower, and the uh, generals know how to get generals follow orders. So they did implement it. But it, is, it, it really is kind of a shame that, you know, all these people who had fought in World War II shoulder to shoulder uh, were not recognized as full members of the armed services until beginning in 1948. So tomorrow is a very significant day. And I, and I think most people recognize uh, uh, Jackie as an American pioneer and an American hero. It was not an easy thing. So I have been working with the Red Sox, as Jean mentioned, for 25 seasons now. And during that time, I've interviewed over 125 former Red Sox players and uh, had feature articles in almost 150 of the uh, uh, programs, what we now call Red Sox Magazine. And uh, when we were younger, probably paid a quarter or maybe 50 cents for the program. Uh, now it's Red Sox Magazine, it costs $5. I'm not sure that's progress, but I'm in the uh, $5 program, so it's probably worth it from that point of view. Kidding, of course. <laughs> so I think you can all name uh, who the greed applies to. That's obviously the players. And uh, avarice is really greed that's been institutionalized. It's when a large organization can put out a uh, press release justifying their unreasonable position. So uh, as somebody who loves baseball and has been very involved in baseball, I found it very upsetting that they, they being the owners and the players couldn't get together and reach some sort of compromise much, much sooner. You know, it was a chance to give everybody in the country a boost. Everybody was dying to watch some sports. I mean, I would have put baseball in front of a lot of people who said, uh, I'll never watch baseball or I'll never watch baseball again because there was nothing else. It was a great opportunity to, to bring some of them back. And, uh, you know, it was, it was just a, a tragic loss of that. And uh, so that's three strikes, they're out. And now I'm going to tell you stories. I think, I think we all enjoy hearing stories. And I'm, I'm confident you'll like my stories as told to me by the players themselves. And I, I'm gonna focus particularly on uh, uh, the economics. I'm gonna go all the way back to 1946, uh, talking about Johnny Pesky. And then I'm gonna fast forward eventually to 1967, uh, talking about Mike Andrews. A lot of stories, a lot of interesting players. Wish I had time to do more. But uh, I think you're really going to enjoy the stories. Can't be a better place to start than Johnny Pesky, Mr. Red Sox. Johnny did every job for the ball club that there was to do. He broke in as a player in 1942. Eventually, he became a coach, a manager. He actually did the uh, color on uh, uh, Nesson and, and uh, you know, 38, he said, I stunk. I was terrible at that. But that Johnny was very, very modest and, and, and very honest, a terrific guy. And, uh, 
you know, he told me I would have played for nothing. And uh, in fact, uh, we talked about it, and, and he modified it to say, as long as the Red Sox paid me enough money to have a nice life with my family, if I had to choose, I'd choose beating the Yankees over having more money. And John was a pretty sincere guy. I actually think he meant it. And the same was true. I, I was fortunate enough to interview Ted Williams, or he interviewed me, I think, uh, as well as Bobby Dua, Don DiMaggio, Boo Ferris. And they all felt the same way. They loved the game, <laughs> and they wanted to beat the Yankees. And uh, unfortunately, they didn't beat the Yankees enough. He, he told me a story of uh, being invited to a, a banquet in New York uh, 50 years later. And they put him at a table with Vic Rashi and uh, some of the other stars that uh, the Red Sox had played against and lost. And, and Johnny said, I didn't want to sit with them. They didn't want me <laughs> sitting with them. Uh, but we just kind of nodded. He said, yeah, after a while, we started talking baseball. And they weren't really bad guys. <laughs> but they took, they took it pretty seriously in, in those days. In fact, there was a non-fraternization rule. You could not get together with the other team before a ball game. You want to go out for a drink after, that's different. And uh, nowadays, they hug one another. I mean, <laughs> what's up with the hugging? I mean, I love hugs, but please don't be hugging the other team before the game starts. Um, just a kind of funny <laughs> feeling I have about that. So Johnny, for his off-season job, sold tickets to the Red Sox. Went in the front office, get on the phone, dial for dollars. Actually, originally, he probably didn't dial. He probably spoke to the operator. So can you imagine picking up your, your phone and it's Chris Sale, and he said, hey, I've got a really good price on the 10-pack. Well, that's effectively what happened. Johnny would call him and get talking and try to sell him a 10-pack, a better season ticket. So they all had to do something to uh, make ends meet. They didn't make that kind of money. Now I'm going to take you to uh, another beloved former player, Walpole Joe Morgan. Everybody remember Joe Morgan? Six, two, and even, and I'll get to that in, in just a minute. Joe is a quintessential uh, baseball guy. He was in the game for 45 years, played for about 15, and then either coached or managed for the balance of that time. But that was his game, and uh, he loved it. And I was fortunate enough to sit in his den a couple of times interviewing him and see his well-worn baseball digest. Uh, people don't do that anymore, but, you know, if you go back to uh, the Boston Braves and a tryout in the late 40s, you probably do. And uh, Joe never really became a, a star player. But one thing he told me that impressed me was, Wherever he went, and he actually played 15 years in 13 cities, wherever he went, he also took his family with him, which you think about it, pretty remarkable. And uh, he went and he played winter ball in Puerto Rico one year, and brought the whole family. So that made a big impression on me. And uh, John, of course, uh, uh, was tried out by the Boston Braves, signed with the Boston Braves, and uh, never became affiliated with the Red Sox until he became the management, manager of Pawtucket, the Pawtucket Paw Sox, the almost soon to be late and lamented Paw Sox. <laughs> and uh, so John, <laughs> Joe, Joe Loved to talk to the fans. And I remember uh, when my son was about 14, we were both at a ball game. We were there an hour uh, before. And, and Joe came over and he talked to us for about five minutes. And, you know, it really made, it really made a difference. And, and I mentioned that to him when I did get a chance to, to sit and interview him. And he said, 
Whenever he had free time and he saw a parent with a child, he made it a point to go over and talk to them and try to make them into serious baseball fans, the game that he loved. Now, his biggest success came in 1988 when uh, he replaced the then skipper. And uh, he told me that at the middle of the season, he was asked to uh, uh, take over as the interim manager. And uh, had more, Morgan was, uh, Gorman was talking to him. And he said, we want you to take over as the interim manager until we can look around and find somebody uh, to do it permanently. And Joe said, don't look too far because he's standing right in front of you. Any of you have heard uh, Joe Morgan, he, he's well spoken. He, he's 90 years old and uh, doing okay. And uh, really one of the great guys. So they named him interim manager and right away, the team won 12 straight games. So they said, okay, you're going to manage to the end of the season. Then they won 19 out of 20. And Mrs. Yaki gave in and said, okay, <laughs> he's permanent this year, and he'll be permanent the next year. And uh, that's how he ended up having a, a run as Morgan Magic. And uh, I, uh, standing in his driveway in Walpole, he said, you know, 25 miles that way is Pawtucket. 25 miles the other way, Fenway Park. I live in the perfect place. <laughs> and so I said, Joe, what's up with this six, two, and even? You know, it, it was never really very clear to me. And he said, well, you got to remember, I grew up around here. And so I'm well familiar with the uh, local media. And uh, you got to keep them off their toes. And and running around in circles saying, anybody know what six to an even means? And because uh, when they'd ask Joe, he'd say, look it up. And he said, the reality is it didn't mean anything. I was just trying to throw them off balance. <laughs> and I had some success. Well, it turns out later, it, it, it is actually a horse racing term. Uh, I can't recall what it meant, but, you know, he got so much publicity, somebody uh, called them from uh, out of state and, and explained what it meant. But it certainly served uh, uh, Joe's purpose. So now we're going to drift into the 1950s. And these are the players that I pretty much watched growing up and learning to love baseball. And one of my all-time favorites, of course, is Billy Mamboquet, the pride of Medford, Massachusetts. And uh, Billy went to Medford High. You know, he grew up in, in West Medford. There's an interesting connection I'll get to. West, Mes <laughs> West Medford, say that three times, was a stop on the Underground Railroad. And a lot of the uh, uh, people traveling on the uh, Underground Railroad decided they'd gone far enough and settled there. So our good friend Billy Mamoket grew up really with best friends of, of all races, colors, and creeds. And he said, yeah, we never gave it a thought. It wasn't until I went to school that I learned about prejudice. You know, that's quite a commentary on school and, and society. I think of uh, Billy as the nicest tough guy I ever met. And boy, was he tough. You would not want to get on, on Billy's bad side. And uh, uh, just as one example, uh, back in the day, uh, before they signed a player, they'd have him come into Fenway Park and just work out during batting practice and, and get a sense for the guy and how he'd fit in and that sort of thing. So Billy came in, uh, went through that, and they signed him to a contract, minor league, starting the next day. Now, the Red Sox had uh, given Billy and his mother and father nice tickets to stick around and watch the game, nice way to finish it off. And, and so, uh, you know, I'll now be Billy. Billy said, you know, he was sitting in front of a couple of wise guys. And uh, 
At one point, we turned around and said, uh, could you quiet down? There's a lady here. And they kind of laughed at us. And then the next thing we knew, they spilled beer on my mother. I looked at my father. My father looked at me. And we were off to the races. <laughs> we got up and cold cocked both of them. Now, unfortunately, he got arrested. <laughs> and he ended up in a holding cell in Fenway Park. So I talked to Bill. I had no idea there was a, a holding cell in Fenway Park. But he said, ah, you better call upstairs because I'm supposed to be in Albany tomorrow morning. <laughs> and so they called up and, and went to the front office. <laughs> executives came down and, and straightened the whole thing out and uh, uh, Billy in his first at bat in the major leagues faced Billy Martin who a lot of you will know is one of the toughest guys to ever ever play the game and his first pitch he knocked Billy <laughs> on his tail crowding the plate and uh, it, it, that was pretty gutsy things. He was a rookie, his first, uh, first at bat, and he knocks down Billy Martin. And he said, finally, he, he popped out Billy Martin. And uh, he came back across the field, coming awful close to me. And he said, I put my finger in the glove, <laughs> and I was ready. <laughs> if he went after me, I was ready to go after him. And uh, all Billy Martin said was, uh, pretty fresh for a busher. And it turned out that uh, Billy Martin had stolen home a couple of innings earlier. So the way things worked in those days, you were going to get knocked down the next time up. You know, Good for you stealing home plate. How do you like a dirt? That kind of thing. Very, very different game. Now, I mentioned West Medford and how, how it would uh, turn up later is something of significance. In 1959, the Red Sox finally got around to signing and, and bringing the major leagues and African-American players. Sadly, the 16th team out of 16. Although, you know, it's interesting. The first African-American to play for a professional Boston team was in 1950. And it was Sam Jethro playing for the Boston Braves. Sam the Jet Jethro. A lot of people don't realize that uh, Boston baseball had been uh, integrated nine years before uh, Pumpsy actually got there. And, you know, the players had to get used to having a, a player color around. And early on, uh, they were in the dugout, and one of the coaches, Del Baker, was yelling racial epitaphs across at the other dugout. And Mambo said, you got to knock that off, Del. Pumpsy is with us now. And Del said, well, what are you going to do? And he said, well, listen closely, because I'm going to knock you right on your ass, right in front of players and anybody in the <laughs> stands who can see you. That's what I'm going to do about it. Now, you've got to keep in mind, he was a 22-year-old who'd been around a couple of years. Del Baker had been in uh, Major League Baseball for 40 years. In fact, uh, Mambo finished off by saying, you might be a coach, you might have been around for 40 years, but you're going to have to do what I tell you. And so Del Baker kind of disappeared, and there was never, ever a problem of that nature, which actually calls to mind another interesting story, and that is Ted Williams and uh, his reaching out to Pumpsy Green. Back in those days, and some of us still remember, the players would warm up before the game in front of the dugout. And uh, so everybody chose up, matched up with somebody. And the first night that Pumpsy was in the uh, clubhouse, Ted said, come on, Pumpsy, we're going to go play catch. And uh, it was a symbol to all the players that he was welcome. He was part of the team. And he played catch with Pumpsy. In fact, there's a John Updike uh, uh, story, Gods Do Not Bid Adieu, in, in which he talks about Ted warming up in the way I just described, with the, they use the term a Negro, and, uh, and with a different name. And, and I asked Pumpsy, 
is that true? Was he warming up with uh, somebody else? He said, he played catch with me every single day that we were together on the team. And of course, Ted then surprised everybody in 1965 when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. He said, I just wish that the wonderful players, Josh Gibson, Satchel Paige, all of those wonderful players from the Negro Leagues aren't in here where they belong. Now that shocked everybody. <laughs> no, nobody was, you know, uh, campaigning for that to happen, number one. Number two, nobody ever realized uh, how passionate that uh, Ted was. And the it was the last thing anybody expected. But I'll tell you what, that's how there was a special wing put on the Hall of Fame for the Negro players, thanks to Ted Williams. So Billy, <laughs> Billy Mamboquet was an authentic. Uh, one year he was pitching for the New York Yankees. That's where he ended his career. And uh, the next year he was managing a club for them. And he said, one year I was staying at the Four Seasons, traveling in first class. The next year I was driving a bus to the Blue Ridge Mountains <laughs> as the manager of a class A team. <laughs> But Billy, Billy could do it all. And that brings me to one of the greatest athletes we've ever seen in Boston, jumping Gene Conley. A lot of you would remember Gene, a lot of people. I see a lot of heads nodded. He's the answer to the trivia question, who pitched for the Boston Braves, the Boston Red Sox, and also played for the Boston Celtics? And then people always say, oh yeah, that was the organist. What was his name, Jelly Kiley? But in fact, it was Gene. Gene pitched in 1952, briefly, but he definitely pitched for the Boston Braves. And uh, they went out to Milwaukee. And uh, in the off season, he played for the Celtics. Not his first few years, but he, he said he'd get a call from Red. And uh, Red said, well, you can, <laughs> you can try out, but you have to pay your own way. I don't know if people know. <laughs> Red Auerbach was the biggest cheapskate in the history of mankind, but you know, he certainly knew how to run a basketball team, didn't he? So Gene, uh, in fact, was traded to the Red Sox for my buddy Frank Sullivan. And Frank Sullivan was almost 6'7". Gene, of course, was 6'9". And uh, <laughs> my friend Frank Sullivan called it the biggest trade in the history of baseball. <laughs> and Gene was actually a standout in baseball as a pitcher, a standout in basketball. He played 18, 20 minutes. He wasn't somebody they put on the bench for, for show. He was the uh, backup power forward. I back always said he backed up Bill Russell. Conley said it never once played at center, but you know, read like the way it sounded. So I'm going to tell you a story about the Holy Land. I'm going to tell you a story about a little chapel in North Carolina. And I'm going to tell you a story about angels in Inman Square in Cambridge. All of these feature Gene, and it's really quite amazing. <laughs> in, in 1960, <laughs> Gene and Pupsy Green get off the bus going to the airport in New York City to have a quick beer. Uh, and when they, when they finished their beer, they looked out, the bus was gone. <laughs> so Gene, Gene said, well, oh, what the hell, we may as well keep drinking. And they did, they drank enough <laughs> that Pumpsy actually uh, stayed with them in New York. But then he went back to uh, Washington where the team had gone and apologized, always forgiven. On the other hand, Gene kind of wandered around and at some point went to what was in Idlewild and attempted to buy a ticket to fly to Jerusalem and uh, certainly became big news. And one interesting story, uh, <laughs> when he eventually did come back, Tom Yaki called him in, opened his bottom drawer, pulled out a big bottle of bourbon and said, Want a drink? <laughs> and Gene said, oh, no, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> I don't make plans like that anymore. Uh, maybe just as well when I tell you a couple of other stories. Um, 
you know, he reached the end of the line and, and didn't know how to do anything but pitch. So he hung around, pitched in the low minors, and finally he, w he was released. That was the end of the line. And uh, he said he was in Podunk somewhere and uh, bought his Greyhound ticket. Bus wasn't going to be for two hours. He spotted a little chapel. So he went in there, killed time. And he said he actually started crying, but he didn't know what he was going to do. Turns out there was somebody in the chapel, presumably the minister. And he came over and he said, what's the matter, son? Did you lose your mama or your papa? And he said, no, sir, I lost my fastball. <laughs> she was pretty quick on his feet. And it turned out he shouldn't have been worried about what he was going to do next because he became a, a paper salesman and the most successful paper salesman in New England. Everybody wanted to meet him. Everybody wanted him to come in. Everybody, everybody wanted a piece of Gene. Uh, the problem was, over time, he had become a, a problem drinker. And uh, one day, he had made a huge sale in Cambridge and decided, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, that he'd go in a local bar and uh, celebrate with a shot and a beer. And uh, exactly what he did. And he said, after a little while, somebody across the bar, a young man across the bar, looked at me and he said, you're Gene Conley, aren't you? And Gene said, yeah, you always have to be recognized. He said, yeah, yes, I am. And the young man said, it really makes me very sad to see you in here with the other drunks. You were my hero. And Gene said, my wife had tried to get me to quit drinking. My minister, my doctor, my kids, everybody I knew had tried to get me to stop drinking. But for whatever reason, those words hit home. He said, I slapped a $20 on the bill, got up, and never, ever had another drink. <laughs> and Gene would call him my angel, my guardian angel. Never saw him before, never saw him again, but you know, in many ways saved his life. So there's, there's Gene, and uh, again, we're, we're, we're heading into... Uh, uh, colorful territory as we work our way through. Um, we, we go all the way ahead to 1967, uh, the Impossible Dream Team, my favorite team of all time. And uh, you know, it had uh, some great players and it had some players that never had another moment in, in the sun. They had one player, Mike Andrew, a lot of you remember him from being the executive director of the Jimmy Fund. Uh, and he was a terrific rookie second baseman uh, for the Red Sox in, uh, in 1967. But he had a job in the sports department of Sears and Roebuck back home in Southern California. So after the celebrating was over, he hopped in his car, drove 3,000 miles with his wife and two little kids. And he said, as soon as I got there, I started getting calls. I, I got a call from Russ Gibson, who was my great pal. <laughs> and the rest of the, you got to turn around and come back here. These people can't get enough of us. And, and a lot of you remember, you know, the, the effect that uh, the 67 team had. And he said, you know, they'll pay us $50 out every night of the week, and I get a free chicken dinner. So get in your car and come on back. <laughs> and, and Mike said, after about three calls like that, uh, he decided to do that and never left the area again. Uh, and, and so many of the players from that team stuck around. And I think that, you know, to this day, people still talk about that team. And I love to talk about that team. Love to answer any questions you might have about that team. But so many of them stayed in the area that they stayed in that consciousness. You know, today, they win in 2018 hang around a couple of days for the parade, get on a plane, plane to California, to uh, uh, Florida, to uh, Arizona. And, and that's the last we see of them. They're really like uh, Hessians, I guess you could say. And maybe that's a little harsh, but uh, in fact, uh, I, I perhaps have been uh, too harsh in the modern day players because a couple of years ago, I interviewed four players from the 
2013 team, the improbable team. I think a lot of you remember. Nothing was expected, and yet somehow they came through and won a world championship. Most unexpected. But the real contribution that year, remember, that was a year of the marathon bombing. And uh, they were ready to, uh, to head to the airport. They had played the, the first game of, of the Patriots. Patriot uh, game going back all, I guess, to 1927. So they're getting on the bus and they hear all these sirens. And, then, and once they get to the airport, they finally realize it had been a, a terrible tragedy. And uh, the city needed healing, and that team reached out and did as much as they possibly could and insisted on as little publication as possible. And uh, so I got to interview David Ross, who's now the uh, manager of the Chicago Cubs. I got to uh, interview the flying Hawaiian, Shane Victorino, uh, Ryan Dempster, a whole crew of them. And, uh, you know, they, they all said, we really want to thank the city of Boston for letting us be involved. It meant a lot to us that we could make a contribution and, and feel part of the community. Usually, you know, we flew in, flew out. And, and in this case, we really felt as if we were part of the city. And uh, we really want to thank the people of the city of Boston, Massachusetts, for allowing us to do that. And uh, Ryan Dempster, when I got through his interview, said, you know, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Now, there haven't been a lot of players thanking me. There actually had been a couple. <laughs> but it was kind of amazing to uh, involuntarily say, I really appreciate said, you know, it stirred up a, a lot of memories of things that one way or another uh, I'd forgotten. So all is not lost with the current players is still an opportunity for good works. And, and that, another point to, to leave you with, several of them said, we were an older team. You remember they signed everybody who walked in the door for $13 million a year. And uh, uh, most of them were in their early 30s. And, and they all said they thought because they were older and they were fathers and uh, they could identify uh, that that made a, a big difference. But, you know, they were all terrific, and I'm hopeful about the future. And uh, I've gone on, and probably tired of listening to me or hearing me, and I'm hoping that we might get a couple of questions, I, really on anything, including uh, other players I might have interviewed. I, I've interviewed most of the uh, uh, substantial players, and uh, by that I mean they played eight to ten years, uh, made a contribution on the field and off the field. And uh, uh, it's, it's been a play. I have enjoyed every single interview. I was scared a couple of interviews. <laughs> and, and I'll go into that if you want me to. But <laughs> does anybody have any questions? I'd be delighted to. Uh, yeah, if anybody would like to ask any questions, just unmute your mic and um, ask yeah. away. Go right ahead. I have a question. Good. Uh, in 1967, uh, I heard that Dennis Bennett and Lee Thomas were roommates. <laughs> yeah. And Dennis <laughs> Bennett was kind of yeah. crazy. <laughs> he told him to shut the light up. Uh, Lee Thomas asked him to shut the light out. <laughs> I know it's got. I, you know what this. <laughs> But they don't, so tell them what happened. <laughs> so Dennis Bennett took out a, I don't know, it was a pistol, I guess. It's up a gun anyway. It shut the, shot the light out. <laughs> <laughs> that certainly took care of that. Yes. Now, they, in fact, um, the first day of spring training, the two of them came into the clubhouse. They're 20 minutes late. And Dick Williams, who, and I can, tell you some Dick Williams stories. <laughs> he was hell on wheels. And so they come in 15, 20 minutes late, and of course he takes them to task. And they say, oh, the operator didn't give us our wake up calls, otherwise we would have been here early. And he said, okay, I can fix that. I'm gonna have the operator call every room at 7 a.m. every morning. 
so it won't be a problem in the future. <laughs> when I interviewed Dick Williams, he said, you know, I could not be a manager today. It was probably uh, 2005, 2006. He terrorized the players. <laughs> they were scared to death of him. And uh, I remember uh, Gary, Bill's, uh, Gary Bell, who was a pitcher they picked up in, in mid-year. I remember Gary Bell saying, we were the most united team in the history of Major League Baseball. We were united in our hatred of Dick Williams. <laughs> and I told that story to, to Dick, and he said, yeah, but they all cashed their playoff checks, didn't they? <laughs> About 15 years later, he was managing San Diego, and, <laughs> and one of the players said, the first thing I'm going to do when I retire is get in my car and run over Dick Williams. <laughs> he didn't do it, but I think he would, would have liked to. <laughs> Other question. What is Pedroia doing now? Ask me some hard ones. If you, you know, maybe I'll give myself a quiz. What was that, Ron? Do you want to ask that again? Uh, I wonder what is Pedroia doing now? Oh, Pedroia, you yeah, know, that's really sad. Yeah. I mean, the way he played the game, you just had to uh, had to love him. And uh, not only with enthusiasm, but with a high level of skill. You know, he's a guy who won the Rookie of the Year uh, his first year, obviously. He won the MVP the next year. Uh, that that's no easy task, and uh, you know he's hanging around trying to see if he can rehab. But you know, I I don't think we'll ever see him again. It, one of the interesting things about Pedroia is every place he went, people looked at him, looked at his size, and said he's never going to succeed. <laughs> and every place he went, he showed them he's my size. Yeah. I've seven. They always list them two inches taller. Like Mookie is five foot nine, and in fact he's five foot seven. I stood next to him, and he was my height. But you know that that's been going on for time, eternity, probably always will. That was good. Well, thank you. Very interesting. My pleasure. Enjoyed being with you. Anybody you else have a question? <clears throat> I have another thing I could bring up. <laughs> Please. It's um, they talk about things that'll never get broken, like Joe DiMaggio's mm. hitting streak and stuff. Right. But there's one that <laughs> nobody talks about, and I just found out about this a couple of years ago. But is Red Barrett for the Boston Braves, and he had. Uh, he pitched a complete game, and he only threw something like – I was trying to look it up. But he only threw about 50 – it was 50-something pitches in doing a complete nine-inning game. Whoa. So two pitches <laughs> per batter. And I thought, that's not going to get beaten. Yeah, well, I, can't, I, I can't see that happening at all. That, that's, yeah, it was 1940, 1946, I think I looked it up, as Boston Braves. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, the Braves, I think most of you know, actually, they were the first team here in 1871. They were <laughs> a member of the National Association, and, and then in 1876, Chad, a member of the uh, uh, new National League, and they remained here until 1952. So they had seniority on the Red Sox uh, the whole time that they were here. And uh, Red Sox were always the top team. And uh, a couple of years, uh, 1948, of course, uh, they went to the World Series, the Braves, that is. And unfortunately, 1948, the Red Sox also won the pennant, but they tied for the pennant. They had a one-game playoff, which they lost 8-3. to three. And, and a couple of interesting stories about that. Uh, Rudy Tebbets was a catcher on that team. And to this day, if you go to research books, it's going to say that
that Rudy went around the clubhouse, asked everybody if they wanted a pitch, and uh, nobody did. And, and when I interviewed Mel Parnell, I said, because he was uh, probably the, the best pitcher on that team. I said, is, is that a true story? He said, absolutely not. I knew I was going to pitch that game. And uh, in fact, the night before I went out with my family for dinner and made a point to, to uh, go home early and get some rest. He said, when I walked into the clubhouse, the ball was in my locker. And that's, and I think they still to this day uh, put the ball in the starting pitcher's lock. I was there, he said. I was getting ready. In fact, I was ready to go up and play catch. And uh, Joe McCarthy, the manager, came over and he said, sorry, kid, the way the wind's blowing out, I can't go with a left-hander. And, and he said he was shocked. And uh, unfortunately, uh, they lost 8-3 to three where Mel might – might in fact have uh, won, pretty good chance. Uh, and then we would have had a subway series between the Boston Braves and the Boston Red Sox. Such a shame. In fact, we wouldn't even have to take the subway. You very easily <laughs> walked from Fenway Park to Braves Field and, and back. It was re really unfortunate. And, and you know, on the, uh, on the Parnell, Story, I asked Bobby Doerr, I asked Johnny Pesky, I asked Tom DiMaggio, you know, how did they remember it? And they remembered it exactly the way that uh, Mel Parnell remembered it. He was going to pitch. And uh, I, I think it was Bobby Doerr said, I, he thought that maybe Birdie wanted to make himself a big deal. And, and so he went with that story. Now, and one more Mel Parnell story, and then I'll stop. Mel Parnell, uh, was a southpaw, won more games than any pitcher and left-handed pitcher in Red Sox history. And he had a, what we call today a slider. In those days, it was a knuckle curve, and it had fallen into disuse. And, and now here's an irony. His next to his neighbor in St. Louis was Harry Burkeen, who was a star pitcher <laughs> for the St. Louis Cardinals. Who defeated the Red Sox in, the, in seven games. And uh, Tack Namel, after he signed with the Red Sox, he said, you better develop another pitch because uh, you aren't going to get away with just a uh, fastball and changeup. And so Mel said one of his minor league managers had taught him to throw the slider. Nobody else was. Don Newcomb in the National League was throwing the slider. And he said players would come up to me and say, what's that pitch? And he said, well, I get hit in the left hand. It never really was the right. So if I hold it in the, just the right position, it does funny things. Well, it turned out that uh, uh, he made that up. Peter Gammon wrote about somebody who had the hand broken and said, could turn out like Mel Parnell, get a, a, a special pitch out of this. And I wrote Peter a note and said, Actually, that's not the way it went, Peter. But he didn't return my note. You've all been terrific. And, and uh, Herb? Yes. Can you just answer a couple more questions. We have one. Uh, do you have any stories about Bill Lee? <laughs> How much time do you all have? <laughs> um, I think everybody would love to stay around and listen. <laughs> uh, there's only one Bill Lee. I'll tell you two things that may not be immediately apparent. He's a very, very smart man. Hey, you know, he learned how to pitch from his aunt, Annabelle Lee. Can you imagine? I mean, that was really her name, Annabelle Lee. She was a left-handed pitcher in the Women's Baseball League. And she was the only other left-hander in the family, so she taught Bill how to pitch. <laughs> but, um, yeah, a, a natural wit. Uh, you certainly wouldn't want to attempt to match wits with him. Uh, he, he loves to be different and, uh, you know, good for him. He, he's done a lot of good charity work. And, uh, and he loves baseball so much that he's still playing. And uh, pitches in uh, senior leagues down in Fort Myers. He lives in, uh, out in the islands during the winter, plays baseball. And 
he may be the funniest man. Well, actually, Frank, my buddy Frank Sullivan was the funniest man of all time, but <laughs> funniest baseball player. <laughs> or at least that's what Vince Scully said. And if Vince Scully said he's the funniest baseball player ever, he was the funniest baseball player ever. But, uh, you know, Lee is, is a, a close second. And, and again, very, very clever, very smart, and uh, a lot of fun. I've interviewed him three different times. I said, you know, have you mellowed? And he said, a candle that burns too brightly goes out too soon. Yep. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> he had a very interesting life, I'd say. Yeah, I will agree with that. That's awesome. Um, Herb, the, there's a question in the chat yeah. from Ted about whatever happened to Billy Rohr. Ah, yeah, that, that's a great question. It, and many of you will know, but it's worth refreshing. Uh, Billy Rohr had his first, his debut in the Major League Baseball. He was a left-handed pitcher in Yankee Stadium in 1967. They had actually opened in Boston. First game in the Major Leagues. In, in Yankee Stadium, and Billy Rohr proceeded to go through eight and two-thirds innings without giving up a hit. And, uh, and that's pretty remarkable. Uh, the Yankees were not the uh, Yankees of earlier days, but they were very, very good. And uh, Russ Gibson told me the whole story. He was a catcher. It was certainly a, uh, a big deal to him. They're both rookies. And uh, yeah, they got a no-hitter going in eight and two, three. And in the ninth inning, uh, uh, Kyle Strunkin Yaz had made one of the great catches in, in Red Sox history, still shown to this day and, and still still amazing. And uh, so everybody knows his grandson is a big star with the Giants now. But I digress. Billy Rua, well, Dick Williams told me, here he is, one more out, and he's got his no-hitter. And Dick ran out and said, you know, this guy's kind of a high ball, fastball hitter, so be careful here. And, he, and, and Dick said, ran back to the uh, dugout. And the next batter, Howard, who was their catcher, Elton Howard, uh, singled in the right field. It was a clean, clean base hit. But just before that, with the count two and two, Roy threw a beautiful pitch that uh, Russ Gibson went to his grave really believing that they had him struck out and he had the no-hitter. He said, because, it, he said it was close, but there's a rookie on the mound, there's a rookie behind the plate, there is a Hall of Famer type at bat. The umpire said, I'll go with the Hall of Famer. And uh, Billy Roy at that point looked like he was going to be one of the great left-handed pitchers of, of, of Red Sox history. And in fact, he won his second game. Well, mostly people say never won another game. Well, in fact, if you want to look it up, he, he won a week later, exactly a week later, a Friday night game in Fenway Park against the New York Yankees. 7-1, uh, I believe it is. But then he never... Uh, won a game that season. He was up and down, back and forth. But Dick Williams said, I kick myself all the time, and he wasn't one to uh, kick himself, because he, he really felt that if he'd stayed in the dugout, just left Rohr alone, let he and Gibson work the fastball, and, uh, you know, talk about over-managing, he said, I think I cost the guy, the kid is, is no hitter. He was a young guy, 23, I believe. So, all right, um, he was traded to Cleveland, won another game or two, and went to California where he became a very successful uh, attorney. And uh, <laughs> he, 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 he said he didn't like to talk about it because it talked about it being the almost no hitter uh, because it was so painful. But in time, he realized in every year on April 14th, Billy Rohr would call Russ Gibson and they'd laugh and they'd talk about it and spend a good time catching up. And uh, 
when Russ passed away, I think it's about eight years ago now, uh, Billy Rohr continued to call his sons. Yeah. So that's the kind of guy Billy Rohr is. Huh? Terrific. Oh, Lucille, I'd love to hear your question. Now, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you perfectly. Uh, good. Uh, I'm an old uh, Brooklyn Dodgers fan. And, oh, good for you. Uh, but when they left Brooklyn, it <laughs> never was the same, you know? I mean, but I, I'm just very curious about how, how long ago did the rivalry start between the Yankees and, and the Red Sox? What's the background? Is it, is it Babe Ruth? Tell me about that. There's a long, colorful, <laughs> a long, colorful history. And, uh, and, and it, you know, it's kind of ironic because uh, the Red Sox had won five world championships by uh, 1918. The Yankees hadn't won anything. And oh. Then we had the famous uh, Bambino trade where Babe Ruth was traded to the Yankees and became one of the great players one of the great batters in the history of, of baseball. Probably the most important player because he would have pitched his way into the Hall of Fame oh. as well. And uh, wow. he wow. came, came to the top just after the 1919 Black Sox scandal. And fans are really pretty cynical about the whole thing. And uh, now he caught the country, you know, became the number one guy. In fact, he made more money than the president. And uh, they asked him about that. And he said, I had a better year than he did. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this was college, I think he was right. <laughs> so and, weren't, weren't the Red Sox the first winner of the World Series? That's, that's exactly they right. They were? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. The game was played at the Huntington Grounds. Uh, it was a best of nine series. And, wow. Yeah. A couple of years. In fact, that was part of the problem with the, with the Black Sox. Uh, they had to okay. go back to nine games. But uh, I'll come back another time, I hope. And uh, <laughs> so over the years, they fought fear fearlessly. <laughs> and the Yankees always had the edge, really, up until uh, – 2004, when we get some pretty solid revenge, yeah, uh, yeah. down three games to nothing, and uh, and let it get away and let the Red Sox uh, overtake them. You know, Kevin Millar told them before Game Four, "You guys have better win tonight because if you don't, we're coming <laughs> after you and you won't have a chance. Don't let us up." <laughs> <laughs> You've got to come back again. You've got a lot of wonderful stories. Oh, well, thank you. I'd love to. Yeah. You know, in, in other years, I've uh, made a presentation of the Situate Council on Aging. And, you? You know, and, and by this time, I would have spoken to maybe a dozen, 14 groups. And I really loved it. And uh, so I'm glad we were able to do this. Uh, this is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Can I just tell a, um, a quick little story about... Um, my dad in the Red Sox, if mm. does anybody mind? No. Yeah. Okay. So um, my dad, when he was, I'm thinking he was in his teens and um, they were having tryouts for the Red Sox. And I believe they came to the Prairie in Roxbury, which I know a couple of people on here know of that location. Huh. And my dad was on a team with his brother and, you know, the neighborhood kids, you know, they were just a bunch of kids from Roxbury that played baseball. But of course they thought they were, they were the ultimate and they were all going to be, they're going to go try out for the Red Sox and they're all going to get on the team. Yeah. So they tried out and um, I guess Ted Williams told my father, he was a little shit and he would never make it. Pardon my <laughs> language. <laughs> he kind of said something like that to me. Yeah, <laughs> and um, my Uncle Lou actually made it, but never pursued it. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, so that's pretty cool. So to, to, well, my dad passed a year ago, but until he passed, he always hated the Red Sox. 
They, they will never redeem themselves for that comment that he made to me when I was a kid. <laughs> anyway, that's my funny little Red Sox story. Yeah, that's I mean, that was good. I love, I love it. <laughs> What's happening to the Red Sox this year? They're so bad. Well, you know, I consider this kind of a novelty season. You know, I, I don't take it very seriously. People are pitching, trying to pitch seven inning no hitters, and uh, you know, the whole thing kind of makes me dizzy. I have to say, uh, I've been watching. I've been watching baseball for, for seventy years, and, wow. and, and this <laughs> is my seventieth consecutive year going to Fenway Park to uh, to see the Red Sox, and I'm going up. I'm the Green Monster Saturday night mm -hmm. in cardboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thinking tech. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Maybe you'll bring them luck. Ah, I hope so. <laughs> I hope it's not too cold up there. I told, <laughs> I told if you get if you get hit by a home run ball, you dissolve into uh, sawdust. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So much. Well, we'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. And her, yeah, thank you so much. much for coming and sharing all these wonderful memories with love us. And we'd love to have you back again. Love to come back. Um, so I'd like, again, to thank everybody and to let you know, actually, next week, next Thursday, same time, we're going to have Christopher Daly with us. You might have seen him. He did our uh, presentation on um, No Irish Need Apply. Oh, he's going to be doing a presentation on um, Sacco and Vanzetti 100 years later. This oh, is wow. the 100th anniversary. Oh, wow. So he's going to have a slide presentation, um, and he'll be doing that. I'll be sending out all the information. Again, you can register and join us. We'd love to have you. Um, I hope you enjoyed this format. Brand new for me tonight. I think it went well. Um, and thank you all.